Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. This week, Michael Sant'Arcangelo and myself will discuss privileged identity management. As we stated in the earlier segment, in fact, it's kind of becoming more of a trend, which is, I find it interesting because if you look at the, I studied some of the definitions, Michael, <laughs> and it's, it's out of control. It's out of control. So we call it privileged identity management. That can also mean privileged access management, user management, account management, password management, account security, identity and access management. IAM is another one, uh, which is kind of in this same space, uh, includes technology needed to support identity management. In 1976, IBM set the, they claim, set the standard for security products with Rack F, which was used to identify, verify system users, identify and protect system resources, authorize users, and control means of access to resources, which, I mean, essentially we're talking about the same thing. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, uh, you know, when we had Doug on, the last time the three of us were together, mm-hmm. Doug was talking about his mainframe days. That's Rack F. Mm-hmm. There, there you go. So, you know, I guess if we want to go dust off Doug, he can, he can talk about it to us. But no, I, I, I think what you just offered in the introduction to this is this is an area that has confounded and confused people for at least the two decades I've been doing it. And yeah. so we've called it different stuff. It used to just and be it, called identity management. Then it was identity and access management. And then it was, and now we look at PIM um, and it's a, it is a sub component to it, but gosh, we sure carved it out to stand alone, but then it means any number of different things. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's interesting as, as people think about this, um, and we're going to get to what's the problem we're trying to solve, but to kind of jump to the solutions uh, it, it, I think it, it, it solves some of the problems such as, okay, who has administrative access and how do we control and protect that, right? That's one component. I think it's also what should users have access to and how do we protect and control that, which is a different, a different thing. Um, administration and, and user access are two different things, essentially. And then I also think it, it, people have explained it to me, and Michael, you can confirm or deny this, that it can build trust relationships between systems and manage that as well, which that's a completely different thing. Yeah, I'm going to agree with it and say, I, I don't want to be so flippant as to say no two are the same. What I'm going to say is, yes, I, I see people using us a lot of different ways. And I'm, I'm glad you asked the question of, of what problem are we trying to solve? Because yes. w- you know one of the questions that we have in here is like, who are the leaders and, and what are the different ways? And, I think sometimes this, the, the answer is, well, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And if somebody says uh, identity and access management or privilege access management, no, no, no. no, no Come no. back to me functionally. Yes. And this is where that translation really matters. It's almost like um, I put out an article earlier today that said it, from a, a neuroscience perspective, you can communicate more effectively with primitive drawings than anything else. What's funny is I, I've been proving that for years, mostly because my drawing skills are primitive anyway. Mm-hmm. But, you know, yeah, go to the whiteboard and draw it out. Start asking those questions. And that's going to help you with any of those things. I mean, there's so many different ways to do this. It's, it is taking a look at what some of those core problems are. When we had Josh Abram on the show, on Security Weekly show last week, Michael, he did a report across 100 penetration tests, 75 customers, and said, that basically the top five problems are related to authentication and authorization in the environment. The top five ways, not that they, it's not how they get in, but how they fully compromise an environment and get access to everything. The top five, I believe it was all top five things were related to authentication and authorization. I believe that. Listen, so when you came in, NT4 still around? Yeah. Okay. I remember. Do you remember? NT351. Hey, I was okay. on OS2 yep. Warp if you really want to go. Okay, good. Go All right. So then we're, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I knew we we're basically the same age. So, okay. So we've got the same lineage. So I remember, um, I mean, I, I cut my teeth on 351, but I remember 40 when that was the big deal. There, We had a, a little tool that we used to load on a three and a half floppy and uh, you could put in, it was an automatic way to, to escalate domain privilege. So as long as you had a domain account, you could boost yourself to a, an administrator and you know, you basically booted this up and it would, yeah. it would just tweak it. Right. So that was 20 years ago. 
of, of course that's a challenge. Mm. And that's where a lot of this stuff came in. I mean, you know, if you go into the average organization, let's look at it for a second from, from a functional side and employee side. One of the challenges and one of the reasons identity management became a problem was uh, think, think functionally, right? And this is high-level baseline stuff. How many systems does the average person organization have access to? Last time I actively participated in counting on this was about a decade ago, and it was somewhere north of 28 systems. I, I got to think now it's much higher since I'm mm -hmm. reading reports that the average enterprise has over 400 different systems and applications, uh, and at least 10 to 20 percent are deemed critical. All right, that's telling me there's a lot of people in the organization that have access. So one of the challenges came into, well, are our password policies consistent across all those systems? Mm. No. Is our naming system consistent? No. So let's say I have somebody that's an insider threat, which is, right, that was a problem 20 years ago. It's a bigger problem mm -hmm. today. And they get escorted out of the building. Now I need to go either audit their accounts or shut down what they had access to. Okay, well, what did they have access to? Oh, I don't know. I can't tell. Right. And I, I think over the years, the, the organizations that I've worked for and with, in certain areas, right? Not across the board. I think in some areas they did have, you find the smaller like PIM solutions, right? For certain areas of the organization. But on the systems administration side, it was more manual, you know? Yeah. No, in, in fact, it, I, it was all, it was all manual and it never, I don't know if it never crossed our minds, but it was like never enough of a pain point or not recognized as enough of a problem to say, Hey, we should have a tool that helps us manage all these trust relationships for, and I like the three areas, right? Administrative access, user access, and trust relationship between systems. I've managed all of those I'm and gonna, it's a nightmare. I'm gonna challenge you on that because this is when I cut my teeth and a lot of the stuff 16 years ago. So like, you know, once we got through Y2K and everything was okay, but now we have all these distributed systems, we started to realize these problems and I'm, I'm I'm going to tell you candidly from my experience looking at it was with the lens of experience, we had kind of two challenges. One was we didn't know how to describe the situation well enough. I'll tell you what, one of the, the most memorable things, and I, I've given this example when I talk about communication a lot, but there was a, it was a hospital system. So there's a level of complexity in hospitals. Mm. And they wanted to look at role-based access control, but we had to look at the fact that I might have a per diem nurse who works at two or three different hospitals, but on one is in a maternity ward, on the other is in ICU, and in the third one is doing some other service. How do I craft those rules for that person? Right. Which is still a pretty interesting challenge. In most it, and I think that's why it, it, you don't see this more prevalent or more people talking about it, because just the thought of trying to define all of those relationships and then keeping up with how they change, it's a daunting task. I think it kind of well, falls in the same so, thing of like, why we don't have secure system configurations for all of our systems and know exactly which exactly. ports they talk like it that kind of it falls in that category of just being a whole ton of work that people don't want to take on now i met a i met a guy uh doing one of these leadership summits uh about a year and a half ago and we had a lengthy conversation because i frankly didn't believe him at first they underwent a nine month effort to build in a new identity management program I don't remember exactly how they phrased it. And they went from 1,500 roles down to, I want to say it was like 50. Mm. Well, maybe, I, maybe it was 100. It was really manageable. So as you can imagine, I had a lot of questions. And here's what he admitted. It was painful. Yeah. But, but they had done a full-scale analysis. Now, they were in a critical infrastructure protection uh, category. And they said, you know what? We realized that, as you just said, uh, the authentication, the authorization, that was going to be a huge problem for us. And so we had to think about it differently. And it took them, like of that nine months, the first six was all just figuring it out yeah. and, and working it through and working it through and working it through. And, and it was, he said it was painful, but when they got down to the end of it, he said, man, we've made the administration so much easier, including we can provision accounts faster, we can mm -hmm. check what's going on, we can deprovision faster. So what I think is interesting because we talked about how cloud is kind of forcing this back. I've seen a lot of organizations now that tried to, to I'll, I hate saying fight the battle, I hate those as analogies, but uh, tried to work on something like this years ago. And here's what we found. I didn't have any way to segment access within. So if you think about it, 20 years ago, how likely was it at a hospital to be able to, on the fly, further apply access controls or authorizations based on 
time you locked in or the system that you logged into. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really do it. How about today? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying everybody has it, but what I'm saying is... No, but a lot of uh, uh, medical institutions and healthcare organizations, I should say, have that now. And largely HIPAA drove that. And that's where these systems... And that's one industry that I think has latched onto this more than others because of that HIPAA requirement. And my, my wife works in a... Uh, in a hospital and so when she describes the things that have happened over the years like it becomes clear that you're right michael they didn't have that but they have that now so much so that they're controlling who sees a diagnostic image when it was taken and they also control who looks at that like you can't just go lie in this particular situation you just can't log into a system and go look up a patient that that you didn't do the exam on and they're controlling that and logging that. And yep. so much, I mean, people get fired, right? I mean, that's because it's a, a clear um, violation in, in a lot of cases. So, uh, so you yeah. know what I think is interesting? And this is an area where you've got more experience than me. But if, so if we look at all the changes, I mean, again, one of the things that I love, that I'm fascinated by, and you and I have made this comment across all of the programs, there's a lot of stuff that we're able to do today that we weren't able to do 20 years ago, but that we kind of had an inkling to, or as we've talked to some of our guests they're pulling up papers from the 70s and 80s that yeah. explained how to do it. Yes. But again, we lack the processing power. So again, I'll take a briefing and somebody will say like, well, we're able to do you know, behavioral analysis, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, right, but you know what? People told me that in 98 and it wasn't possible then. What changed? Oh, well, you know what changed? Our ability to capture fine grain detail, more pieces of it, process it better, process it faster. Those are things we couldn't do all those years mm-hmm. ago. So what's interesting is as we come back to identity management, I think we've got that opportunity now that, right, that forcing function from the cloud, the need to be able to control and manage these things better. But also, I think now we have the ability to get some systems that alleviate some of the problems that we've felt over the years. So if you're an enterprise, you've been trying to deal with this, I I think that you owe it a different look. I want to offer a concept. Uh, There's a guy, uh, and if this is interesting, I'll, I'll introduce you to him. But he introduced me to this model uh, called Identity Governance Administration. If you're tracking this space, it's not a new concept. It's been at the Gartner conferences already, and there's a couple people that are talking about it. But here's why I liked it. If you think about it, 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 and this is kind of like the evolution of identity uh, management, uh, identity and access management, privilege identity management. By, By calling it IGA, you're separating identity from the governance from the administration. Now, there's a lot we can do with that, but what, here's what I love from a simple elegance perspective. What's your identity, and how does that work in the organization? What's the governance model look like, and how will you validate that? Right? That's important from a security perspective, but it's also a who should be the person to provide the governance. And then there's the administration piece to it. And in the past, what's happened is we've lumped all of that onto the administrators, which has made yes. their task almost right. impossible. So by looking at the same challenge in a different way, you now get the ability to say, okay, well, the admins need to be able to do the admins based on the policies. Well, who should write those policies? Not the mm-hmm. security people. Right. right. That's, that's not our job. That's, that's the business's well, job. And, and on the, the kind of system to system, which I think is a, an easier problem to solve because you're not involving the user. And I would, uh, my recommendation is to start there. And I, I think back into my past when, it pointed out security problems. And I think the technology that we're talking about today can certainly help. And I'll give you a great example. There, uh, in an organization, there exists a mainframe and it has you know, business functions and processes and creates data. That data has to then be shared with a newer system. And as applications evolve over time, I don't know, maybe that's an application running on a Windows system. But now they need to share data. So I do my security evaluations and I'm like, so the mainframe makes this data available on a clear text FTP, and then the Windows system stores those credentials and then logs in via FTP and pulls those files back and then does stuff with them. And then the web application lets the user interact with that data. And, I was, and back then I was like, well, FTP is bad. The data is going in clear text, the credentials are in clear text, and the credentials are stored. When really, it's an issue of trust between systems and not, I mean, obviously that's a bad situation and this can certainly solve the credential issue. Obviously they need to be transmitted encrypted as well, but 
it also uh, brings up when what happens when a system is compromised, how do you reset that trust relationship? What happens uh, when that window system is compromised? The key question. Now, I need to reset that trust relationship because otherwise, like really bad things are going to happen. So uh, in this technology for me, it, when I started to think about it in some of that context and based on my experience, can really help that situation. And I, it's an easier thing to solve, right? I mean, I was on the, the, the Unix team. And we had 100 or more Unix systems, Linux systems. When, how do you, how do you manage access on those? You know, like we would do a configuration script that would like add and, and remove people. But then how many trust relationships did we have between systems? While it's not... It's not easy, but it's it, it's within the realm of possibility, certainly, that in a reasonable amount of time, you could figure out those trust relationships pretty easily and then implement a solution to do that. And that's when you, I think, can start really getting into this space and start using it more effectively. And I think you start with the system-to-system relationships and being able to reset those credentials is 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 huge. I think it's a really good point. So I want to I want to make a comment. Then I want to ask you a question that's going to build on top of that. So the first the comment is this is why I like using IGA as a model because what you just described was I I can have an identity and then there's a trust relationship. There's an administration component to it, but there's a governance model. And some of those questions that you ask come in that governance model. How often do I need to verify the trust relationships? Mm-hmm. How do I verify the trust relationships in the event of a compromise or change? How do I handle and process that? And that has implications for both the identity and for the administration, right? So I like separating those models out a little bit. Now, one of the challenges that we've seen for years, and I'm curious your take on this, and if you think we're better at this, hard coding passwords and applications because they needed access to those databases. Absolutely. And I've never seen, I mean, I know why it's a bad practice. No one has to appraise me of that. But I've been in some places in the last couple years that have experienced some sort of, not necessarily a breach, but some of those passwords, let's say, were disclosed in a way that was disadvantageous for the organization. And I said, cool, so what are we going to do about it? And it was just pure panic because they said, I don't know. Mm. And I, I absolutely... What do we do about Yeah, that? applications need to trust each other or, or be able to authenticate uh, and have some authorization component. And that, I think, is left behind more often than not because... Basically, the application development life cycle, right? <laughs> it's, it's really hard to develop an application. And then when you put some kind of restriction about how it gains access, more often than not, it's going to break. You have to go through some work to be able to fix it. <laughs> so I, they've just, you know, they've just hard coded the, the passwords. But I think this is a great use case where you can help solve that problem by properly authenticating between applications. So. Yeah, and well, and I'm going to come back to this. This is again where, when you look at the model of it, I, I think you are going to find places in your environment where, if you had a whiteboard, an unlimited budget, and time to do the ideal solution, that's not what you would do. But you're going to come across it the way it is, and in some cases, the answer is, I'm going to monitor for it. I'm yes. going to look for those different types of things. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's go back to it because we told people we're going to talk about privileged identity management. And you, you made a comment that I thought uh, I probably should have jumped on as a better segue when you said it. One of the things that we've seen happen is that when I try to sell you the dream of identity management, identity governance and administration or any of these types of things, it, it, it requires a lot of thought and engineering and re-engineering and process development and data deduping and sanitation. All right, I can't do that. So what we have seen happen is that people said, well, you know where we have the problem, right? It's, it's the, the watchers of the watchers. It's, it's the super users. It's these administrative accounts. And so, gosh, do you have a way to handle that? And what I think is interesting about it is, and I'm curious your take on this, because when we say, okay, so let's go define the problem or let's go take a look at the challenge or the opportunity, we do have people that at some level need to be administrators. And so some of the ways that I've seen looking at this is in the past, we'd give people domain admin accounts. But then we'd have to say, by the way, it, you, you can't do all your work from the domain admin account. You should only log in when you need it, right? And, and we had ways in, in Linux and Unix to be able to do that. It was a little tougher in, in the Windows world. But now what we started to see is that people said, well, I'll tell you what, there's a password. We're never going to give the people the password, but they can check in and check out to be able to use those accounts if they need it. And or if somebody leaves, we'll change it. So what's happened is we're looking at privileged identity management 
we're saying, okay, there's a group of people who need to have elevated privileges. And if an attacker were to come in and escalate up to those privileges, the damage they could do or the way that they could move undetected would be too great. But gosh, I'm not saying we don't trust our people, but I'd sure like to verify it a little bit better. Why don't we manage that better? Because that's a clean problem. It's a definable problem. It's a much smaller problem. And it's only really going to, to work with the people that are already highly technical. So A, they're more likely yeah. to understand it. And B, I'm not really inconveniencing <clears throat> them. Would you add anything to that? Would you? Would yeah, you no, I, I think that's a great place to start because it's a smaller scale. Um, it certainly represents a, a, a situation that can be exploited easily to get further in terms of breach than, than a lot of other problems. So protecting your privileged accounts in applications or on the system, I think is really important. I also think that if I try and think about some of the native tools to do that, I feel like there are a lot of work and I feel like they don't yes. complete the picture. So having these tools I think is important because, you know, just the, I don't know, the extra functionality that you get in being able to expire, um, reset credentials, the, the controls that you have and the logging that you have. And something we didn't talk about in the basics is the security analytics that's coming into play from these vendors. I mean, yeah. they're becoming more like traditional security vendors every day. And I, that's something we'll talk about next time is, is, is how you do, you know, analytics within these systems and some of the advances that we've seen. So I think it's important to protect your privilege uh, accounts for sure. Using all right. This so then let's take a look at this for a second, because what, what I like about the way you laid out uh, all the different ways to look at it. So now sometimes it's, is your challenge provisioning your privileged accounts? Is your challenge auditing the privileged accounts? Is your challenge the passwords? Do you have limited password limited accounts and a shared password in is you know so it's this is how people have looked at it in different ways and they've tried to give you some amount of flexibility so from an enterprise perspective think about how you handle those today and then think about how you like to handle those and then of course you have to say and what systems do we use you know i mean yeah. like there, there are still people um running a lot of mid-range systems that we thought would be out of business in, uh, in the year 2000, there's a lot of mainframe systems. So now you have to start saying, okay, well, do you, do you, you know, what systems do you integrate with or not? But let me make a, co a comment on that. That's sometimes a canard. Here's why. What systems matter the most? I mean, like if you mm. talk about a mainframe and you're, you're running a pretty tight rack F ship, it's an inconvenience, but you're, you're not harming yourself. And that's where, we, that's where we get that opportunity to think about this space a little differently. Mm. Cool. Well, I think we have to wrap it up right there, Michael. That was a good. Uh, that was a good discussion. I think uh, about the the basics. I like it. We'll we'll continue on this topic on future episodes. Michael, again, thank you for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.